today I have with me Arthur Herda Saunders, and she has written this book, Memories Last Breath. And Herda, oh my goodness, okay, this book has changed my life. And I know everybody out there, this book will change your life. It really will. And I am so happy that you wrote it. I, I can't express to you how happy I am. I mean, there are difficult parts, but your humor comes through and it, it blesses me. It, it blessed me so much to have read it. So thank you so much. Thank you for those lovely words, Michelle. And thanks for giving me the chance to speak with you. Yes. And if I get emotional, it's because like um, five years ago, my mother passed away from uh, cancer, which was not, which is a very quick thing. Okay. But I was in charge of her care. And um, so, you know, I look at you and I, I see my mom and I, when I was reading this, I was like, oh. Oh. so, you know, for, I, you've touched me in, in a very special way. And I'm, I'm just so pleased to have read it. And um, the thing that I loved about your book, okay, was that it wasn't this depressing book about a disease that has taken over your life. It's about your life and everything that's happened in your life and your family's life. And um, I, ha in my, I'm in Pennsylvania, as you know, yes, yes. and in my wildest dreams, I can't picture South Africa. Yes. Well, I... I can tell you a little bit about it, except that it's also such a varied country with varied landscapes. But um, South Africa is, it always, um, people say it has a, a temperature structure, sort of like California, but again, not all the coasts. Um, and then there's the inland part uh, where there are mountains, there's the, the Drakensberg, um, which was a, huge mountain range that the South African pioneers crossed. So some of the American pioneer stories um, uh, uh, exist in South African culture too, about these intrepid people crossing mountains to, to get to the inland. And uh, the, the coastal cities, especially Cape Town, are just they're just so beautiful. Cape Town has... Um, it, it's as if it, ha it has escaped Dutch style in many places and buildings are whitewashed. So there's this white glow from the city in the sunshine. And then, of course, it has Table Mountain, which is a flat top mountain, which is what the very first European um, explorers saw when they rounded the cape. So it, if you're on Table Mountain, it, it's just like you're on top of the world and the city with a beautiful bay uh, lies below you. So uh, it, it's, um, a nat it's a country with great natural beauty. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody believes that from the pictures that we've seen. And, um, but then, and I have been to Utah. I don't think I've been to Salt Lake City though. I think I drove through there. I, I didn't spend any amount of time, but I do yeah. know the area. And, and so was moving there. Um, what did you think of it? Like if that was, you know, did you, was it easy? Was it difficult? Oh, it, it was, it was difficult, you know, but we moved here when um, my husband and I were both in our mid cities, and I think at that age you have a kind of a bravado about you know just going to a new place, and you don't think so much about the separation from family, which was probably the hardest for us. But um, Salt Lake City is in is in odd ways a little bit reminiscent of Cape Town to me. Of course, it misses the ocean, mm -hmm. but it has the mountains. And if you drive along um, a, a road, sort of uh, along the foothills of the mountains, you see the valley down below. And um, so there was something about the landscape that made me feel, okay, I, I can live here. But the social connections were much harder. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can imagine that. Um, when reading your book, I mean, I've read a lot of memoirs in my very long life. <laughs> and yeah. what I loved is like, it was like poetry. 
your writing is so poetic and I, I felt myself really like living in it with you um, through your different stories and that you told and and I, I kept repeating them to people, you know, that I was like, you have to read this book. She tells the best stories, you know. And even though it's about your family, sometimes people are like, well, just because it's my family, you may not be interested. But I love, I love stories. And your stories are amazing. Well, I, I, you couldn't tell a, a writer anything more wonderful than that you enjoyed the stories and the language. So thank you so much for that. And I... Um, I uh, I have a, a relationship to writing that, it, for me, writing has always been a luxury to be able to do something that I had to find time for while, um, you know, making a living and while taking on uh, this, uh, the life responsibilities that many of us have with children and so on. And so... I'm, I'm very much aware of how much, how privileged I am to be able to write. I, I think there's so many people who would love to write and we have a novel or a memoir or some other book in them and they, they don't have the time. But that, is, that was in a way a gift of my dementia diagnosis that you, you have to reinvent yourself in a radical new way, because you're now not this person you thought of yourself, the capable person who could hold a job, who could teach, and and so who are you then? And so I was able to go to that vision of myself that I always had that that I might be a writer, um, and that in my retirement I had the time to to produce a book even though my writing is incredibly slow and difficult because of my memory issues. But I had the luxury of, it sound, may sound strange, but the, the luxury of an early diagnosis so that I knew that, that this was ahead of me. And so many other privileges are wound up in that because I could have that diagnosis because I had medical insurance. And... Um, then I was able to go to a neuropsychologist that my medical insurance didn't pay for, and I had to pay out of pocket for it, and it was a lot of money. And we turned the money around but you know, before doing it, but we decided, well, this is something we can do if we think it's important. So all of those things combined to enable me to, to get the medical background as well as my, my experiences in having it. So um, I just want to say that I really appreciate what you say about my book, but I'm I'm so grateful that the universe had that book still in store for me after the dementia diagnosis. Yeah, did you find that writing down those memories actually was very helpful for you to, to be able to recall? I mean, I even know, I mean, I'm 52. I have six children. I had a lot of things yeah. <laughs> that you kind of forget. No, the people will say, well, how did you do that? I don't know. I have no idea. But like if I had to sit down and actually try to write it out, they always say that that is a very helpful way to recall, you know, different stories. Because you know how your children can be like, oh, remember when you did that, mom? No, I have no idea. I have, I have no memory of that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think that the uh, good thing about those childhood stories are that there's nobody around who can really verify them. <laughs> so if I remember them incorrectly, you know, I can I can make myself the hero in them and yes. nobody will know any better. But um, I actually did uh, with one story, um, I used one story as an instrument to see how good my recollection is. And um, so then I, I asked my brothers and sisters to comment on my version of the story. And um, I, I, I could tell you about that if you would I, like. I really want you to tell everybody, not just me. I want to hear it from you, but everybody's going to love this story. Yeah. So um, I grew up on a farm in South Africa in what was in the Transvaal, so, so the inland part of it. And we lived in a, a 
my and, and my father uh, came to the Transvaal from Cape Town, where he was a, an engineer, uh, to help his father on the farm. So he would inherit a portion of the farm and his brother and, and so on. But so he, our portion of the farm was land that had been worked agriculturally, but uh, or portions of it, but. Uh, the place where we would build our house had never been worked. Uh, it was also, it was a little bit rocky and, you know, not so good for making the straight rows. Um, so uh, it was still wild uh, when we moved there in the sense that there were still small animals around jackals and rabbits and uh, especially lots and lots of snakes. So we would warn our children to to be careful of snakes. And uh, but you know you you hear the warning and then everybody sort of forgets. Even my parents. You know we would go outside. We very most often were barefoot. And <laughs> so one day I was about eleven, and my my um, my oldest brother was about, I can't remember, eight, I would say seven or eight. And we had made ourselves some stilts and by uh, nailing um, empty jam cans, uh, you know, jelly cans onto sticks. Uh, and so we were walking on these stilts and we just came past a rock pile and we always looked out for living things. And so in the rock pile, there was a gap, you know, about the size of a big fat dictionary. And so there was a gleam of a snake. And it was it was really huge for it. Where you, if you looked in that gap and all you saw was snake. So we got so frightened, we jumped off our stilts and ran home to to tell an adult, as we've been instructed to do. So my father was out in the lands, um, the, the, the uh, tobacco fields, and my mother came to verify that the snake was there, and it was still there. It, not, it had not moved an inch. And she decided that this was enough snake to set up an alarm. So she called my uncle, my father's brother, who had a gun. And eventually he came over, and my my Father also came home from the lands, and then we all had this this party armed with farm implements to kill snakes. Um, so they decided to shoot it after looking. And so my uncle shot, and at the moment he shot, it seemed like there were hundreds of little snakes that just burst out of this opening. And by then, my uncle had identified the snake as a puff adder, but what he and um, my parents and everybody knew, but I did not, that was that puff adders are viviparous, which means they carry their eggs inside their bodies until they hatch. And so my, my uncle had shot into this hugely pregnant puff adder, and the, it, it was just, and all those little snakes were alive, and they were just wriggling, except those that had been shot. So on this big flat rock, they were just like little snakes everywhere you could look. Some halves were still wriggling. And um, and so everybody got in with their farm implements and, you know, with spades and with pickaxes and with rocks, killed little baby snakes. And then, um, when there were nothing, nothing was left alive, then we uh, picked up the pieces of snake and we put the little baby snakes, you know, made whole snakes out of the pieces and put them on the, uh, on this huge flat rock. And then we counted 38 baby snakes and the mother, which was 39 snakes in one day. So, so <laughs> that was such a remarkable event in our, in our family, of course, that I remember that story very well. And so I then wrote the story. Actually, it started when, we were visiting my family in South Africa and we spoke about the story and I became aware that there were different versions. Uh -huh. But when I got back home, I wrote my version and I sent it out to the whole family. I said, okay, so now's your chance. Tell me what's wrong with my story. And my brothers, 
my sisters, my, one was too little and the one wasn't present at the event. So it was really my brothers who uh, pitched in. And my brothers just were very free with their critique of my story. And uh, they told me that if I had um, uh, fused two different snake stories. But um, I was the oldest and I was only present at one major snake killing because uh, at, right after that snake killing, I went to boarding school. Oh, the, right. And so but apparently they had another big snake killing, which is a different snake, the Makopa. So he said, you think I confused the Makopa and the Puff Adder incidents? And I said, I, I was not present at the Makopa. I, and my story is of that one. So anyway, I pulled rank as the oldest and said, this is <laughs> story. But when we teased it out, it seemed that we all agreed on the main points of the story. But it has made me more and more aware that that the other stories that I tell of where I was the oldest and I was four years old, there was there's nobody to correct me. Right. So I, I tell my stories just with, with the spirit of um, uh, the Moth Radio Hour where they say, these stories are true as remembered by the storyteller. That's right. <laughs> well, I think there's a saying in history too, like history's as true as the person that wins and gets to write about it. So, yeah, 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 exactly. So I, I claim that uh, I, I claim that uh, viewpoint of the historical writer. Well, you know, being a Pennsylvania girl, um, we don't have snakes except for little teeny tiny. So I was like, oh, my God, what a, you know, you, you get used to wherever you live is what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, Utah made me feel right at home because there are huge infestations of rattlesnakes um, mm -hmm. here. And when our first house, too, was up against the mountain, sort of the second row of houses, and then above that was only mountain. So we had rattlesnakes on our driveway and uh, once even in our house. Uh, and it felt eerily familiar from my childhood. At least you could deal with it, because I'd have passed out somewhere. It would not be good. So. <laughs> 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 okay, so I want to talk a little bit about your dementia and because I just feel like you're so brave to be as honest as you are about it. There are a lot of people out there suffering with it and it's difficult to talk about and, and people don't really want to. It's something that people don't want. I mean, especially as we get older, you know, we don't want to think that we that can happen. You know, it's not something that I would want to think of. It's not, it's almost as diseases go and you think about way, you know, things you're going to get, you know, as horrible as cancer is, it's not dementia and it's not a, it's not your body. Um, I don't know. It's not fighting your body. It's fighting the things in your brain. And it's, it's a difficult thing because you know it and then you don't know it. And I just wanted, I'm just so happy that you can be as brave as you are and as honest in your book about it, because I've never read anything like it ever. Um, you know, and, uh, like I said to you before, I mean, if I get emotional, it's because I've, I watched my mom, your children are watching you. I know what that feels like. I have six children and I know what, as they're becoming adults, I think about it. I think about what I want them to see because of what I experienced, but you also got to experience it with your mom also. Yes, I did. I think that the fact that. I saw my mother live with dementia. Uh, it was my first um, experience of living close to someone with dementia. And in in our family, we didn't hide it. It was not my, my mother's uh, weird memory was not necessarily thought of as dementia, at least not for quite a while. Right. Um, right. And in South Africa too, there wasn't, I think at the time there wasn't even the possibility of a diagnosis. It's still, it's still difficult to just say, okay, somebody's getting old, their memory's getting weird. So what is it? it you know, it could be Alzheimer's, it could be the kind of um, uh, dementia that I have, which is uh, cerebral microvascular disease, which means the little vessels in my brain are getting clogged up. So uh, nobody really cared too much in my mother's case what what the situation was, but we all knew that she was not 
she was funny in the head, as we thought. And our family always also already had the kind of black humor that you uh, recognize in my book. And so we spoke about that and and we we actually we laughed and you know so it was something that nobody was trying to hide from anybody else and that was my attitude uh, going in even before getting the diagnosis my family and I had spoken a lot about my my memory lapses mm -hmm. and so they were quite aware of it and I don't think we we didn't self-diagnose as Rosa mentioned but I certainly looked it up on the internet and could recognize my symptoms. Um, so the question never really was that we wanted to hide it. We, when, when the diagnosis came, uh, Peter and I spoke about, you know, the question was just when and how to tell people and not whether to tell them. And so, so we told them, and I, you said the word brave and, I truly cannot claim that because my attitude has always been that that truth is more important, even in many cases, than my own comfort. Uh, because you, it's some truths are uncomfortable, but you just get into more and more trouble in your life if you're not open about them. And also in this case, this is a disease where I'm going to need increasingly more help. I already need a lot of help. And if you don't have the honesty to tell people, look, this is what the problem is with me, how can you then, in integrity, ask them for help? So th that's really how I felt. And uh, in my situation too, um, I think like many, many people, I'm curious and I wanted to know what was this behind this disease that so many people have a form of now. So for me, when I found out those things, even though these things did not bode well for my future, there was it was such delightful information for me to understand on a cellular level what was going on in my head that I just I just wanted to tell people about it. Because I think knowing that also helps take the shame away. Right. Because right. it's like like you can look at cancer. Okay, there's something weird going on in my brain and my cells are acting up and doing weird things. And it's just not something that I have to make an excuse for. Right. So because of all those ways that I feel, it does not feel brave to me to speak about it. Oh, well, that's all. I mean, I, and I do think that, that maybe that was the reason, like that it was on your heart to talk about it in such a way because you didn't it wasn't hard for you it was a very natural thing for you to be able to do and let me tell you it is a gift for your children it really is it's a it's a huge gift to be able to talk about it and that they feel like they can talk about it and you can kind of go through it together um that's that's what i think i anyway you know in my in my opinion <laughs> well thank you well my children have all read uh, at least huge parts of previous versions, so it's not like a totally new thing to them, but um, they've all bought the book, and my son and daughter-in-law were here last night, and my son said he was, he reads it on a Kindle, so he said, I'm 30% 30 30 <laughs> done with your book, and my daughter-in-law said, I'm at this particular chapter, and then he told her, well, maybe, uh, maybe we shouldn't read that chapter. And she said, why not? He says, because she speaks of old people and sex in there. So, <laughs> you may so, not want to know that much. <laughs> we're joking about it. And I said, well, uh, it takes a very mature person uh, or child to recognize that their parents must at some time or another in their lives have had sex and may even – continue to do so when they're older. So, uh, I mean, it was, it was not, uh, those kind of things are not uh, so, say, natural for me to talk about. But I feel that in dementia, the, the whole issue of uh, an intimate relationship is a huge issue because women uh, or men get, um, they, they have to be in a care center. And if they marry, there is still such a thing left as the comfort of a body you've known all your life. Yes. That 
that transcends for me the the fact that that you you may not know this person's name, but you know you know, you know on some level this is the person, and if you want to cuddle up with them, um, you know, and 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 um, nursing homes used to not allow spouses to like cuddle up. Yeah. With each other, and nowadays they're much more enlightened, and they they let that happen. But I just think that even aspects like that, it's not that I just want to talk about it. It's that it is crucially important if I should ever have to go to a place like that. I would want to know that my husband can come and get in bed with me and cuddle me because it's one of our our biggest comforts for each yes. other. So. So that's why I even speak about things like that that most people would not not want to talk about. And, and I think the medical community is learning more and more instead of thinking that just because there's things you don't know doesn't mean touch. And, you know, like you don't know it in a different, just because you can't speak it doesn't mean you don't know it, you know? Yes, yes they, I believe so. Right, I think they always thought if you can't speak his name, then you don't know who he is. And that's yes. not, and, and they're finding out that that's just not true. You're absolutely you know? right, Michelle. Well, and I just want to tell you that what I, another blessing of that you have is that you have Peter. I have been divorced twice. I have six children yeah. and I'm single. And the fact that you like have somebody, I was, I, when I'm reading those chapters, I was just crying because oh. it's something, you know, when you grow up, when you're a little girl, that's what you want. You want that yes. person. And when my life turned out different and I didn't get that, it's a, it's a hole. Like I always felt like it was this hole and, you know, and maybe when I'm 60, I'll be able to figure it, look back and say, oh, that's why at the moment I don't know why. But I, you know, I was so emotional during that because I was like, at least you can call him. Like you have somebody you can call and, you know, and he's right there yeah. with you and going through all of this. It's such a, it warms my heart. <laughs> well, 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 thank you. It is, it is such a gift in my life. And it's one of those things that, that I think it, it's a lot of it is just plain luck. And Peter and I met when I was 17 and he was 19. We got married when we were 21. Mm -hmm. I, I was 21, he was 22, 23. I mean, what do we know about the world? I mean, it's ridiculous when I look at 17 year old kids. That's how old I was when I made this decision to stay with this man for my life. I think it's utterly ridiculous. Um, and absolutely just pure luck. And there was something else that we we both we both very committed to our commitment. Right. And right. at we had very difficult times in our lives, but we were also very fortunate that at least one of us in each of those difficult times hung on to the commitment. And also, there are things that happen in relationships that someone can be, one person can just stop being interested in maintaining this relationship properly. They could be an alcoholic or a drug addict and have no interest in changing. And in those cases, that is, you know, what can you do? You can't make somebody else turn the corner. But we were just lucky that at each point, and that we did not turn the corner at each point because we were so smart and because we had such good communication skills. I can tell you straight out that Peter had cancer twice in a row uh, in his 50s. And before that first time, we were going through a very, very difficult time because he had been working out of state for almost three years by then. I was staying at home with my teenagers and... It was very difficult, very strain, much strain our relationship. And um, and so by the time he was diagnosed with cancer, we had just moved uh, into a small apartment so that he could stay back in Utah. We'd sold our house so that we'd have the flexibility to move as a family to a different state. Right at that point, he was diagnosed with bladder cancer. And I can tell you, we were still very much busy working out our communication and you know, the hurt of three years was there. And the minute he had bladder cancer, the, we did not speak about our relationship one more time after that. 
we just we just became a team and we worked through this and in working through the cancer it was in a sense it was it was kind of like a manifestation of the difficulties in our relationship and by attacking the physical disease and supporting each other in that it's as if we worked through those issues that we had and he was barely declared free of that cancer when he got another one and that is prostate cancer so in case we didn't get the message the first time you know we certainly got it the second time and and so um so i think those are things that were just fortunate and those are the same kind of things that in in some couples could just be the straw that breaks a camel's back but it was fortunate for us right that that we had i i think we had family examples of care for somebody mm-hmm. in need and it was just not anything each of either one of us could walk away from right and that and that's what makes it so beautiful too so so, <laughs> so are you still writing like you are you know i mean do you have plans to write anything else or are you just doing a diary are you keeping any kind of i mean is writing still part of your daily life um it is i would say daily but i do probably write something at least every week and i write short pieces um reflective pieces on my dementia and i post it on my website on a blog and i don't know that i will write i don't think i am able to write more than that uh the way my my head is now uh, the 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 even the thought now when i look at the book i just feel so lame uh, you know just like like all the all the air goes out of me to think oh, so i'm so glad that because i'm just, i could never ever do it now uh, it was really hard to finish it so i had hoped to to complete a novel that i had Uh, that is mostly written and then i had to put away some 15 years ago when life just intervened and you know i had to work much more than i had before but i don't i looked at it and i cannot keep i cannot keep the whole thing in my head i i don't know that i can do it so i i'm i other than writing pieces about my dementia uh i I have a big life goal and then he said I've started writing family history books for my children. That's what and I was going to say that was my next I was going to say but you should at least write like fam- like while you can and while writing is still enjoyable. That was yeah. what I was going to say. Yeah, so I'm writing these and I um I started them out and you know my whole vision for them was that I was making them like scrapbooks but with long stories in them yeah. but I would put for example I'd research our relatives who came from um England in the 1850s and then I would I would research what that town was like at that time why did people emigrate and so I would I would look deeper into the the environment and the social context of those places and I I made So I made three volumes of that uh, with illustrations and with pop-ups and with little flaps that you lift up and uh, and just before I my book you know before I had to do a lot of final work on my book I stopped doing that because the last time I was managed to make a page I kept cutting cutting off the wrong end of the flap or I I could not do it. My spatial sense of right. how to work with that was gone. So I've now um agreed with to with my children that I'm going to just write the story write and it. yeah. And as much as I have time for I'm going to find the illustrations that I want and then it will be up to the next generation to put it together in a book if that is what they want to do. But in the meantime each of my grandchildren have one book uh with Uh, in which I also I tell the history of the universe because that's just a kind of thing I like to do and you know related to them about in this huge huge timeline of the universe they were born like 
a millisecond before midnight and I, I have time scales and and charts and things like that to relate to them. I, you know, I have to tell you that I just started doing that. Oh my goodness. I am not kidding. I just started researching and I'm in, in the process of interviewing my one aunt. And for some reason it came to me that I should do this for my children. I mean, yes. They don't care now. They don't care at all now. They hardly care about my life, but you know, I write down, <laughs> write it down, and I traced it back to England because I'm half English and then I'm half German, and I've traced it that far. I'm stuck at the moment. I don't know how I'm going to figure it out, but I know that with the internet, it, it does make it a little bit easier. But when you said yes. that, I was like, that's what I'm doing. I just, I don't know, on my free time, that's what I just add a little bit and add a little bit and kind of take historical moments and try to place relatives in these history moments. And it's yes. fun, you know, it's a lot of fun to do. So it, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's great fun. And I'm so happy to hear that you have a similar uh, impulse. And of course your knowledge of writing and um, interviewing people, all those skills are going to come together in this wonderful life project that your kids will absolutely love. Yeah. I think that, you know, someday when I'm like long gone, they can be like, Oh, look what mom did. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> they can all sit around and talk about it. <laughs> oh, <that's> wonderful. <laughs> So, well, it's been so fun talking to you. I, I just love you. And, you know, I, I cannot more highly suggest that everybody read this book because I loved it so much and it meant so much to me. And I hope we can stay in touch, Herida. I would love to be, you know, now that I know you, it, it means a lot to me. It means a lot to me too, Michelle. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you do with um, bringing uh, some background of a book in in an interview with an author or in other ways i think that means so much to to us readers and i've i've watched some of your uh, interviews and listened and um it's it's so enriching and i really love what you're doing thank you thank you so much Herida. you have a great day and hopefully we'll talk soon okay i hope so too okay. thanks so much bye-bye bye-bye Oh, <laughs>